Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'd like to continue the reading and discussion of the book Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. This is book one of a two-book series. The subtitle of this issue, this first uh, book in the series, is entitled The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. In other words, the Jesuits and their plans for world domination by P.D. Stewart. Get this book at www.luxverbi.org. That's L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I dot O-R-G. Yesterday, at the end of the broadcast, we were talking about the religious right and how the Roman Catholic Church has control of the Supreme Court and how the ecumenical movement is running along and being promoted by people like Chuck Colson, James Dobson, 33rd degree Freemasons. And all of this is after a long study about Freemasonry. And... uh we're going to continue <clears throat> along these lines uh, in further discussion. It says, Cardinal Stitch was right when he declared, quote, it can no longer be said today that the United States is a Protestant country, unquote. How do you like that coming from a Roman Catholic cardinal? He says it can no longer be said today that the United States is a Protestant country. That's a quote from a Roman Catholic cardinal by the name of Stritch. And it says, For as the Times reported, quote, Evangelicals and conservative Catholics have forged an alliance that is reshaping American politics and culture. This is the New World Order. This is fulfillment of Revelation chapter 13. This is the transformation of of the second beast of Revelation chapter 13 from a lamb-like nation to one that speaks like a dragon. Remember, the dragon is is a, a name used in the Bible to describe Satan. And we also know that the the Bible says that the dragon gave him his seat and power and great authority. And who is the he? We're talking about the biblical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. So it's the same beast, the same dragon that is taking over this country. And here it is. Evangelicals and conservative Catholics, that church that is empowered by the dragon... Evangelicals and conservative Catholics have forged an alliance in the reshaping of American politics and culture, unquote. This is the transformation from a lamb-like beast to one that speaks like the dragon. Because the dragon's got power in the United States now. It's got control. It no longer even calls this country a Protestant nation. It's Catholic. So naturally it would speak like Catholic, wouldn't it? It would speak like a dragon. And that's what this country is doing right now before our very eyes. He says, Charles Beecher, in a sermon February 22nd, 1846, 1846, listen to what he said, 150 years ago, quote, the evangelical Protestant denominations move and breathe in a state of things radically corrupt, appealing to every baser element to hush up the truth and bow the knee to the power of apostasy. What do we see just ahead? Evangelical alliance and a universal creed. Unquote. A universal creed. Sounds rather ecumenical, doesn't it? That's what it is. And this was uh, this was predicted by Charles Beecher 150 years ago. He saw the Roman Catholic Church coming to power and Protestantism caving to that power. That's exactly what we see today in the ecumenical movement. He says, today evangelicals, this is uh, P.D. Stewart speaking, 
Today, evangelicals and Catholics are working together. And no marvel, for as ex-Catholic priest DeSanctus warned us, quote, there are Jesuits in all classes of society, among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. A Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant, unquote. So what have we been talking about? How have these Jesuits infiltrated our evangelical churches? Through Freemasonry. We've been naming them. Chuck Colson, James Dobson, Pat Robertson, Robert Schuler, Evangelicals and Catholics together. These are the movers, the trendsetters for the evangelical world. They're all 33rd degree Freemasons. This is how they've destroyed our churches. This is how they've made our churches Catholic. This is how the Jesuits have infiltrated our churches. No, they didn't come in in Jesuit cassocks. They didn't come in as Roman Catholic priests with white collars. They came in feigning as, as, as Protestants. They feign themselves Protestants but they represent the papacy. And slowly but surely, they're making us Catholic right here in our own Protestant churches. And God's people just have to be aware of this. It says, in this mission to reclaim America for Christ, these quote-unquote Protestants, the likes of 33rd degree Freemason James Dobson, Ralph Reed, was, is, must, must be a, a Jesuit priest himself, Ralph Reed, and Dr. J, uh, J, uh, D.J. Kennedy have placed their services at the Pope's disposal, quote, in the most amicable way, unquote. Today, Catholics and Protestants, in alliance with Masonic presidents and Jesuit-trained Supreme Court justices, are working together and using religion as a mask for political ends. And what might that political end be? An overthrow of the Protestant tenets of our Constitution and turning this constitutional republic into a papal theocracy. That is the end-all and be-all of the ecumenical movement. And this union of Catholics and Protestants, or evangelicals and Catholics together in this country, it's a change of our form of government. It's a change of our Constitution, if not an overthrow of our Constitution. They're making America Catholic. And it says, but the winner will take it all, says the author. And it says, for as Malachi Martin Cooley tells us, remember Malachi Martin, a fourth-degree Jesuit priest who served at the Vatican, was a Vatican in insider who wrote many, many books about the New World Order. He says, For as Malachi Martin Cooley tells us, the Pope, quote, remains the serene and confident servant of the grand design, unquote. The grand design is just code word for the New World Order. Now, soon the Masonic musclehead Christians, these are the ones we've been talking about, the Masonic Musclehead Christians, this religious, this so-called Christian right in this country, it should be rightly called the Catholic right or the ecumenical right. It no longer qualifies as the Christian right. Now, people will continue to use that to describe it, but it's, if you use that term to describe, if you use the term Christian right to describe these people, you've deceived yourself. You are participating in your own mind control. We have to use the correct terms to describe these people. This book, this author calls them the Masonic Musclehead, quote-unquote, Christians, this this so-called Christian right is most accurately called either the ecumenical right or more even more correctly and more specific and more poignant, the Catholic right. This is a union of Catholicism and the brain and spiritually dead 
evangelicals in this country who are making their peace with Antichrist and repudiating Christ and helping Rome take over this government and take over the governments of the whole world. It's, it's insane what is going on. Call it the Catholic right. That is the most descriptive way, the most informative way to tell people what's going on. These people don't even call themselves Protestants. They call themselves evangelicals. But they're not, they don't even qualify as evangelical. They're Catholic. They're serving a Catholic end in this country and around the world. Rome is taking their support as license to take over this country. And when Roman Catholicism overthrows our government, you can blame the evangelicals, the ecumenical evangelibellies in this country. It would not have happened were it for a flourishing Protestantism in this country. And we owe it to the Jesuit under the, the, the Jesuit cover of Freemasonry that infiltrated the, the so-called Protestant churches and corrupted us to accept this ecumenical movement and this, this political alliance with the Roman Catholic Church. It's our downfall. It's the downfall. It's, it's the destruction of this country. The blame can be placed no, no place else. As goes God's people, so goes the nation. God's people have apostatized. They've thrown away their Bibles and their content, their so-called divisiveness, and they've united under the Roman Catholic Church in political issues. And it's their downfall. It's the downfall of this nation. I hope my listeners comprehend this. And it says, Soon the Masonic musclehead Christians will see that it is not a square deal after all. Eventually, some will wake up. But I believe most of the people who are going along with this know what they're building. But it's time to, it's time to repent of this, and it's time to do it now. Now, here is a picture in this book. The caption that we were talking about the red mass. This is at the time of the dismissal of this red mass. Cameras posted out in front of the church. They've said this diabolical mass in the name of Thomas More, the Grand Inquisitor of, of the British Isles, who killed Protestants, persecuted God's people in Britain. This mass that they've all set through, the, the lawgivers, the law uh, profession, the Supreme Court justices, five of them attended this red mass. Five of the, of the nine Supreme Court justices at this time went to this red mass, and they were accompanied by President George W. Bush. The caption under this photograph says, President George Bush walks out of St. Matthew's Cathedral with Cardinal Theodore McCarrick and Supreme Court Justice John Roberts after attending the 52nd, the 52nd annual red mass in Washington, D.C., Sunday, October 7, 2005. The Red Mass, a historical tradition within the Catholic Church, is held on the Sunday before the opening session of the Supreme Court. This is a White House photo. If the American people comprehended what this Red Mass was, if they really knew what this Red Mass represents, we would rebel. And that's what we need to do. If there's any hope at all, God's people have to speak up. Another caption under this, it says, Cardinal Carrick, who's pictured in the center, obviously, of this picture, wearing his gray miter and a black and white pallium over the shoulder, it says, on the other side is President Bush and Chief Justice John G. Roberts, the two altar boys of the Pope. And at the very back is Miss Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State. It's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. This is a picture of the leadership of this country. The executive, 
and judicial branches of the government and the Secretary of State all walking out of the red mass. And you have to know, it's not melodrama to be shaken by this image. Now, what is the Red Mass? The Red Mass is a Catholic event held annually for judges, prosecutors, attorneys, law school professors, and students, celebrated on the feast day of St. Sir Thomas More. Yes, that's right. The Roman Catholic Church made him a saint for his persecution of Protestants in Britain. They knighted him. That's why he's properly called Sir Thomas More. And if you want to look him up on Google, please do. His last name is spelled M-O-R-E. Not the common spelling for More, but his name is Thomas More, M-O-R-E. Now, St. Thomas More was a Roman Catholic responsible for the mass murder of Protestants in England. He oversaw the burning of Tyndale Bibles and was later beheaded for treason against the King of England, namely acting in the Pope's direction over that of the king. He served the Pope. And what does the President of the United States and, and, and John G. Roberts and Condoleezza Rice have in going to a red mass, a Roman Catholic mass, dedicated in the name of a persecutor of Protestants, a burner of Protestant Bibles, and one who even committed treason against the Protestant government of Great Britain to serve his Pope. is simply because all three of these people that I've mentioned do not serve the people of this country. They serve the Pope. President George W. Bush, John G. Roberts, and Condoleezza Rice. Condoleezza Rice is a Roman Catholic. She graduated from Harvard University. Served her Pope well in the State Department. John G. Roberts is Roman Catholic. George W. Bush is a Roman Catholic skull and bonesman, a knight of the Most Holy Eucharist who feigns to be Protestant. He had to do to get elected. And you wonder why this country's going the way it's going. This is it. Freemasonry. Jesuitism, under the cover of Freemasonry, feigning Protestantism, seeks to preach and teach from our pulpits in our Protestant churches. And now the Protestant churches, who don't even deserve the name, have joined the ecumenical movement, have thrown their shoulder against Rome, the Roman Catholic Church's political wheel. They're driving this country back to the Pope. That's... What's going on? That's the ecumenical movement. You can see it on the nightly news every night. Prophecy being fulfilled right before your very eyes. Now we're going on to chapter 44. This, was, this one is entitled Sacred Symbols and Secret Rites. More talk about uh, idolatry, apostasy, paganism. And this is a quote from 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 26 through 28. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draught house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. That's right. God used a godly Jew Jehu, we pronounce it. It was proper, properly pronounced Yehu. King Yehu destroyed and break down all the images of Baal. Do we have the courage to do that in this country today? I'm afraid that's what it's going to take to receive God's blessings. We've got to break down the house of Baal. We've got to break down the images. We've got to tear down their houses and turn them into draught houses. We have to demand that Roman Catholicism leave the country. You say it can't happen. It surely cannot happen if God's people will not repent of the ecumenical movement. Now, the author says in, in March 8, 2007, the religious news service revealed that the Catholic Church in America reported its largest growth, 
quote, the Roman Catholic Church grew to 69.1 million members in 2005, making it the fastest growing church in the country, followed closely by the Assemblies of God and the Mormons, according to a 2007 Yearbook of American and Canadian Churches provided by the National Council of Churches. Remember, we've talked about the National Council of Churches, just an offshoot of the World Council of Churches, and it's the, it's a creation of Rome to help foster this ecumenical movement. They've gotten control of the churches through these institutions. And it says the report went on to say, surprisingly, that the three mainline Protestant denominations, Methodists, Lutherans, and Presbyterians, all, quote, reported membership declines in 2005. This, according to Kevin Eckstein, RNS 2007, uh, Washington, D.C., and it says Catholicism is on the increase. Protestantism is in the decrease. You can't take it any other way. The ecumenical movement is having its effect on this country. And it says, but what if millions around the world celebrate a religion and follow rites which are believed to be uh, which are believed are honoring to Christ in his teachings, but are in fact worshiping another deity or deities, and the leaders know it, but the followers don't. What if this religion has a secret doctrine, which it hides beneath a liturgy of Christian titles and facades, but in fact performs the rites of another more ancient religion, a more universal creed, a creed found among the Hindus, the Buddhists, the Mexican Indians, the Chaldeans, Egyptians, and Arabs. That's what Roman Catholicism is. That's what this ecumenical movement is. The most mature form of ecumenism. In other words, the goal for ecumenism is a global religion that everybody can can participate in. Everybody except Bible-believing Christians. He says, in, 19, in, quote, in 1795, when Napoleon's soldiers took the Vatican, they overturned St. Peter's chair, and to their surprise, they found these words engraved upon it in Arabic, quote, There is no deity but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet, unquote. Could it be that the profession of religion is merely being used as a cloak to conceal a gross evil, a base iniquity? Is it possible that the symbols, rituals, and faith of that religion are not what they purport to be? Could the whole thing be a mockery, a sham? We do not here attack religion, nor are we opposed to religion, but as Godfrey Higgins commented, not every monument of antiquity marked with a cross or with any symbol or monogram of Christianity can be assumed to have been a, of Christian origin. That's right. We need to examine everything in our churches. The iconography, the monograms and all, we'll find it all of pagan origins. Not one of them is sanctioned in the Bible. And if you investigate them, you'll find them rooted way back in ancient Babylon and the Gnostic Gospels and everything else. It's, it's incredible. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them 
as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices, streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone, absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Okay, welcome back to the second half of Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. If you enjoy Inquisition Update, please support Inquisition Update by supporting FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Now we're going to continue our discussion about the Roman Catholic Church. We need to ask ourselves, since God forbid idolatry, where does all the idolatry in the Roman Catholic Church come from? How can it call itself a Christian church? And worse than that, how can the world believe that it is a Christian church when it so blatantly defies the commandments of God? How can this be? How can it feign Christianity but practice paganism openly? without question in this country. We're going to find out that it is not a Christian religion. And not only that, but it is a secret society where the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church practice an entirely different religion than what is preached from the pulpits of the Roman Catholic Churches. There is a duality in, 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 in Catholicism that's barely spoken of, but it needs to be revealed 
to the Protestants of this country, the Evangelii bellies, and also to Roman Catholics. This is, this is critical information for Catholics. Now, it says, like all secret societies... The Catholic Church, too, has an inner and outer doctrine. Throughout history, it has used symbols and rituals as a means of disguising its true doctrines. Okay? It's true and secret doctrines. I'll add the word secret. It's implied in what P.D. Stewart is saying here. He says, speaking of the secret inner... Well, here he uses the term... Speaking of the secret inner doctrine of the early founders of the Roman Catholic Church, Albert Pike writes this, quote, The mysteries were open to the fideli, the fidelis, or the initiated ones, and no spectators were allowed at the communion. Tertullian, one of the founding fathers of Roman Catholicism, says in his apology, quote, None are admitted to the religious mysteries outside of an oath of secrecy. We appeal to our Thracian and Eleusinian mysteries. Clement, Bishop of Alexandria in Egypt, was born about A.D. 191, says in his Sumatra, uh, Stromata that he cannot and would not explain the mysteries because he should thereby, according to the old proverb, put a sword into the hands of a child, unquote. That's the secrecy of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. This is where we get the imagery and idolatry of the Roman Catholic Church is displayed in open sight. It's hidden in plain sight. It's not Christianity. And he says, And Cyril, Catholic Bishop of Jerusalem, from A.D. 315 to A.D. 386, said, quote, The splendor is for those who are early enlightened. Scru uh, excuse me, obscurity and darkness are the portion of the unbelievers and ignorant. Just so the church discovers its mysteries to those who have advanced beyond the class of catechumens, we employ obscure terms with others. Okay? So the true mysteries of Roman Catholicism are revealed to the adepts or the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, while the catechumen or those who sit in the pews, the true meaning of those symbols and signs are obscured. They're given Christian interpretation when they're not Christianity at all. This is how Roman Catholicism qualifies as a secret society, and more correctly, a satanic cult. All right? The Catholic Church here admits to using signs and symbols to hide their true meaning from the ignorant or the catechumens. In other words, there is a secret doctrine. Chrysostom, Bishop of Constantinople, made 354 to 417, confirms that there is such a secret doctrine. Quote, I wish to speak openly, but I dare not, on account of those who are not initiated. I shall therefore avail myself of disguising terms, discoursing in a shadowy manner. Where the holy mysteries are celebrated, we drive away all the uninitiated persons and then close the doors, unquote. And Cyril of Alexandria, Egypt, who was made bishop in A.D. 412 and who transposed the pagan goddess Isis, the Egyptian goddess Isis, into the Virgin Mary, says, quote, in, uh, excuse me, says in his seventh book against the writings of, of Julian, quote, these mysteries are so profound and so exalted that they can be comprehended by those only who are enlightened, unquote. That is to say that the real doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church are revealed only to the true initiates or the illuminated, not to the catechumens or the uninitiated. And it says the great St. Augustine, who, uh, ruled from, uh, who uh, lived from 347 to, to 430 A.D., this is one of the great doctors of the Roman Catholic Church, St. Augustine, 
There's even a, a, a city in Florida named after him. He was Bishop of Hippo and a central pillar of the Roman Catholic Church. He confirms this fact by saying, quote, Having dismissed the catechumens, we have retained you only to be our hearers. Because of sublime mysteries, which none are qualified to hear, but those who by the Master's favor are made partakers of them, to have taught them openly would have been to betray them. Unquote. That's the secrecy of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. This is where the iconography comes from. You wonder when you, when you, when you pass a, one of the Roman Catholic cathedrals, one of the great cathedrals in this country, and you're at a loss to explain the gargoyles and the dragons and all the stained glass windows with images that are frightful to look at. And you wonder, how could this be called a Christian church? Now you know what it's all about. And it says, the sublime mysteries is a term used to express the custom which prevailed in the early ages of the Roman Catholic Church, and to this day even, by which the knowledge of the more intimate mysteries of Gnosticism was carefully kept from all but those who were initiated into the occult mysteries of the Gnostic faith. That's right, this corruption comes from the Gnostics, who were the enemies of the gospel. And it says St. Basil in Despair, uh, Despair uh, writes, quote, These things must not be told to the uninitiated, unquote. All of the founding fathers of Catholicism were Manichees or occultists before they became catechumen in the Roman Catholic Church. All of these early fathers were bound by a code of discipline of secrecy. And it is their occult teachings that were Christianized as Roman Catholicism. You've heard me describe Roman Catholicism as baptized paganism. That's what this man has just said. Through the discipline of secrecy, it was their occult teachings that were Christianized as Roman Catholicism. Thus, Manichaeanism, occultism, and Gnosticism was woven into this brand of quote-unquote Christianity by the Roman Catholic Church. And the statements by the two Cyrils and those of St. Augustine reveal that the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church is for the catechumens and is a method of explaining the mysteries of the Roman Catholic Church in a way that is obscure and will hide the true meaning of from the catechism, uh, from the catechumens, or the, initi the uninitiated masses. The Roman Catholic Church revived the practice of the catechumenate and its rite of Christian initiation for adults, the RCIA. At the Second Vatican Council, which explicitly states at point 64 and 66 of the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum, a uh, sacrosanctum concilium, quote, the catechumenate for adults comprising uh, several distinct steps is to be restored. By this means, the catechumenate may be sanctified by sacred rites, unquote. And in 1980, Pope John Paul II said the mystical worship of the Catholic Mass, quote, the Catholic Church not only acts but also expresses herself in the liturgy, lives by the liturgy, and draws from the liturgy the strength of her life, unquote. And, in, and the 1995 Catholic Catechism says, quote, sacramental celebration is woven from signs and symbols. The sacraments of the church do not abolish, but purify and integrate all the richness of the signs and symbols of the cosmos and social life, unquote. Here, Rome confirms the use of signs and symbols in her liturgy. So what is the secret doctrine hidden from the catechumens of which Bishop Cyril and Chrysostom and St. Augustine spoke? 
For that we must wait until the very end. But I will here contrast these secretisms with the words of Jesus, quote, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, and in secret have I said nothing. John chapter 18, verse 20. The Roman Catholic Church is the antithesis of the true body of Christ. It is what every Protestant reformer screamed from the rooftops. The papacy is the biblical antichrist, and the Church of Rome is the synagogue of Satan. On many things they disagreed, but on one thing they were 100% in unity. And we have forgotten it. We have had that knowledge stripped away from us. And because we've been made ignorant of this most critical information, Rome has now got the ear of the evangelic bellies and are using them to help them take over the country through the government. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, quote, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what Inquisition Update is all about. And if they are not exposed, and if the American people do not respond by getting on their knees and repenting of ecumenism and, and publicly condemning the Roman Catholic Church for its control of our government and instructing our government to kick the Jesuits out of this country and to close every Roman Catholic Church, this country is toast and there will be an inquisition just like history makes absolutely certain. When given the, the, the authoritative strength that the Roman Catholic Church now enjoys, the next shoe to drop is bloodshed. And she'll use the fog of war, just like she always does, to commit it. We're going to see some kind of a, a man-made disaster, whether it be a, a nuclear detonation. We've already had 9-11, and our government took wholesale control Destroyed all of our liberties. What on earth would prevail in this country were there a nuclear bomb to be detonated in this country? One can only imagine. But I'll tell you what, you can see it for yourself, what would happen in this country, by watching that video that I've recommended, A Lamp in the Dark by Christopher Pinto. A Lamp in the Dark. Google it. You can watch that video free online. That is what is going to happen in this country. Inquisition, government-sponsored religious persecution, the likes of we saw in Waco, Texas. Now say whatever you will about David Koresh or his group or his guns. It was a public burning. It was an auto de fe, an act of faith committed by our Roman Catholic government. And it was just a warning shot over the bow. They're going to have ecumenism in this country. They're going to make Roman. They're going to make this country Catholic. And they've already told us what they're going to do to those who resist. And we must resist. We must have the help of our Savior. And we can't get that help so long as we remain in this ecumenical movement. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Christ spoke expressly against mysticism and secret doctrines. Quote, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, putteth it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick that they which come in may see the light. Luke chapter 11, verse 33. The Old Testament book of Isaiah states, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. The Bible uses symbols and signs to explain its messages 
to explain its messages, not to conceal, said Jesus, quote, There is nothing hidden which shall not be made manifest, neither anything kept secret which shall not be spread abroad. And it is my pleasure to get to see that take place right here on this program, Inquisition Update. There is nothing hidden, nothing hidden that if I learn about it, that I will not fully expose to my listeners. Even my own errors. There is nothing hidden which shall not be made manifest on this program. Inquisition update. That's my promise to my listeners. Neither anything kept secret which will not be spread abroad on Inquisition Update. But the Roman Catholic Church uses seemingly Christian icons, images, to conceal its sublime mysteries, its pagan or Manichaean philosophers. The Roman Catholic Church is satanic to its roots. The Protestant Reformers were right. This ecumenical movement is a repudiation of Christ. And it is the downfall of this country. Now, uh, the subtitle of this next portion is The Pope's Pallium. It's one of the garb made of wool worn around the neck of the bishop, the pope, and you have to see it to recognize it. It's a loop around his neck, and then it, it, it hangs down the front like a necktie. It's got all kinds of pagan symbology on it, iconography on it. He says, I must now venture on a subject that may prove a little controversial, says P.D. Stewart. On this I stand to be corrected if I am later proven wrong. Earlier in this volume, I cited from pages 204 in the Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics, wherein it was stated that there is a Masonic degree of Luciferians called Pelatists, who were said to adore Lucifer, who was, in their view, the god of light, and that the name Pelatists is derived from a Palladium. The pagan cross which many would recognize as an ankh, or a crux in sata, or a tau cross, the mystic tau, is topped by an orb, and is an Egyptian symbol of eternal life and was used as a protection against evil. This same symbol also occurs on many runic monuments in Sweden and Denmark, long anterior or precedent to Christianity. This all came from paganism. It says the Ankh and the Tau cross was the male and female symbols combined in the act of penetration. When the Tau cross was topped by a ring or an oval shape standing for the woman's vulva. This was the actual crux and sata, the Egyptian symbol of life, the so-called pallium. The pallium is a broad white woolen band adorned with the fleur de lis, six eight pointed stars, and black Maltese crosses. It is looped at the end and worn loosely over the neck, shoulders, and breast. For Long in the Rivers of Life, Volume 1, page 314, asserts that the Ankh, the Egyptian Ankh symbol, was adopted as the ancient pallium which was shaped thus, and he also gives an illustration of it as worn by the Roman Catholic priests. Today it is important to note that the Pope also wears an ornamental article of clothing called the pallium, well known to historians as a pagan philosopher's robe. It is a broad white woolen band adorned with the fleur de lis, 
six eight-pointed stars and a black Maltese crosses, and is looped at the end and worn loosely over the neck and shoulders and the breast. Uh, for long in his Rivers of Life, Volume 1, page 317, asserts that the Ankh symbol was adopted by the ancient, uh, as the ancient pallium, which was shaped thus, and he also gives an illustration of it as worn by the priests. Today it is, it is important to note that the Pope also wears an ornamental article of clothing called the pallium, well known to historians as a pagan philosopher's robe. The pallium has the same shape as the Egyptian ankh. The ankh and the crux and sada most, uh, are just two terms to describe the same symbol. Like the pallium is an orb or the shape of the vagina, mounted on an Egyptian cross or a tau, which is the phallic representative. When it is placed over the neck and the shoulders, the pallium becomes Y-shaped and forms a bent cross, a well-known symbol of Luciferian worship. The Pope of Rome not only wears the pallium, but as everyone knows, he often carries a bent and broken cross as his staff. The Egyptian priests of Osiris wore the crux and sada over the shoulder and the head, passing through the vestment at the oval or the yoni, just as the popes and priests wear their mass vestments today. So if you ever look at a Roman Catholic priest and you want to know where in the Bible they got their vestments, remember God's priests, the Aaronic priesthood, were given their vestments. They were described by God, and they were made exactly to his order. But Rome gets hers from Satan. It is the Church of Antichrist. It is the synagogue of Satan. And the Bishop of Rome is the biblical Antichrist, and he's the head of this new world order. He's the head of this ecumenical movement to destroy Protestantism in the world. He's the head of Freemasonry and Jesuitism. He's killing us by the day. You need to know about it, and I'll be back tomorrow to talk more about it on Inquisition Update. This is tomorrow. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? 
Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.